Well, we're joined now by one of the signatories, former Tory party leader, Sir Ian Duncan Smith, MP. Good morning to you, sir. Very good to see you this morning. Uh, so morning. why have you put your name to this letter? Because I think the key thing is everybody wants to get the environment right and to clean it up and make sure we have lower and lower and eventually zero emissions. Uh, the key question here is, though, what's the pace you do it at? And at what level of uh, problems do we create for our own industrial base here in the UK? So right now, one of the biggest issues is the Europe itself, the EU, has moved their target back to 2035. The USA has done the same. There's also exemptions, by the way, in Europe uh, for car manufacturers within that 2035 target. We are therefore almost the only developed country in the world now that has still got its target set at 2030 for the end of diesel and electric. And by the way, also remember, they're also talking about uh, other cars as well, those that use both petrol, diesel and uh, electric, so hybrid cars. So the, the key issue here is we have an industry which uh, we simply don't uh, believe is going to be able to make that change in the level that is required and at the cost. Right now, China is sitting on a vast, and I say vast, array of battery producing companies who are now setting themselves up as car companies, electric car companies. They dominate the electric car market. Their pricing is much, much lower, subsidized by the Chinese government. And they're ready to flood the UK market and Europe, although Europe's pushed back on their dates. And that's going to be bad for us in terms of security and bad in terms of industry and jobs. And at the same time, meaning that we are likely to become even more dependent on China, whilst in a way not actually reducing any real carbon emissions at all, because, of course, so many of the rest of the world are still doing the same. Well, we're less than 1% of carbon emissions. So we think it's time to review that target and rationalise it to the level that the others have done as well in our competitor nations. Isn't there an argument to say we just need a bit of clarity on this? Because a lot of people, and it's understandable, think this means all electric and diesel cars are going to be banned in 2030. It's just the sale of new cars. So why does that necessarily cause... A, I mean, I know you raise all these other issues around China and battery production and all the rest of it, but for most people just out and about in their towns and villages, they're not going to be forced to, to get rid of their car. They can just hold on to it. Yeah, they can, but remember the effect, uh, the effect on the industry that's going to have. For example, almost all investment now in lean burn engines in the UK, and we had a global lead in this before this deadline was announced, uh, is pretty much stopped. That means your support for your cars that exist after 2030 is going to get more and more difficult and probably more expensive. It's also another point to say that the cost of the change and the speed of the change is going to fall heavily on the shoulders of those who even have uh, petrol and diesel cars. We reckon now that the estimate for the uh, change to the whole electricity grid, once you try and start moving to here, in, in due course will be some £250 billion. Uh, there'll have to be a huge uh, extension of that grid, huge more pylons going up, more wires going up in communities. Already it's worth reminding everybody that our cost of electricity per kilowatt what hour in the year is something in the order of around about £39 pounds per kilowatt hour. In the USA, where they are still drilling heavily and selling uh, shale gas, it's at £16 uh, pounds per, uh, per kilowatt hour. That's basically two and a half times lower than the UK's cost, which is why our, our cost of living is so high, which is why food prices are so high and why transport are so high. And so this is the key thing. Let's rationalise this. At the moment, the cost is falling heavily on the shoulders of consumers, even if they don't have an electric car. And that's a real significant problem. I mean, you touched there on energy prices. And since the war in Ukraine, of course, we've seen those uh, rise very, very quickly. I mean, energy security is now a big election issue, isn't it? And I wanted to get your reaction to uh, the announcement of 100 new licenses of, of oil and gas uh, in the North Sea. Do you think that's a vote winner? Well, whether it's a vote winner or not, it's the right decision. <laughs> We've been, uh, a number of my colleagues and I have been arguing for some time, well over a couple of years, as to argue why aren't we using our own resources. And here's the problem right now. Because of this kind of uh, really, I suppose, a religion, a new religion on net zero, what's actually happened is that to hide our own carbon emissions, we end up buying oil and gas 
from countries in the Far East particularly, well, not the Far East, from the Middle East. Uh, and that means they still have to drill for this stuff. They still produce the carbon. Only we don't have it set against our targets because we're not doing it ourselves. That, in a way, is a hypocrisy. It means that the same amount of carbon is coming out of the ground, but we aren't going to be responsible effectively for it. So far better to be honest about it. And secondly is the energy security point, which is that we've been paying more for our energy anyway to get it uh, from other countries. Far better for us to drill it in our own islands where we have a huge amount of oil and gas. Worth bearing in mind, we, Im we import a huge amount of gas from Norway, our neighbour, which is busy drilling as much as they can out of the ground, and they're not uh, worried about the carbon target. So the key thing here is there's a lot of, of sort of nonsense going on. We need to be honest about this. Absolutely right of Rishi Sunak to say we need energy security, and we need to recognise the fact that we need to make sure that we ourselves, if we have oil and gas, are still able to get it ourselves without the problems that would exist on broken supply chains. Bear in mind, America is selling as much liquid gas as they can possibly muster right now and drilling as much as they can, whilst even declaring, as Biden does, that somehow he's going green. So we don't want to be the only country that's beaten our breast to pieces on the basis of being holier than thou, when every other country then is able to crush our own economy. We've got to be very careful about how we do this to make sure that we emerge from this. And by the way, you did raise the question earlier about petrol stations. The truth is right now, petrol stations are all privately owned. When we eventually move towards this, with the level and time it takes to charge your cars, these stations would have to be something like a quarter of a mile long, because of course it takes far longer than it does to fill a car with petrol or gas. So we need to look at hydrogen as the better alternative, and this gives us time if we lift the 2030 date to start looking at hydrogen properly and giving our shells a shot at that, where we are global leaders in that technology. Well, that's a very good point. We always get a lot of people emailing in about hydrogen cell cars, hydrogen fuel cells, um, and it's something most of us don't know a lot about, so I think that may be something worth looking at. Sir Ian, it's always good to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed.